Hello, welcome back to Catholic Courses. I'm Father Kirby, and we're continuing our course on the spiritual life. In our course, we have used the basic structure of Luke chapter 11, verse 1, the petition of the apostles, Lord, teach us to pray. We've broken up that verse in order to have three parts for our course, Lord, teach us to pray. The first part had two lessons. We talked about what it means to declare Christ as Lord. The second part of our course was about virtue and the response to the Lord's question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do what I tell you? We are now beginning the third part of our course, Lord, teach us to pray. We're going to talk specifically about the life of prayer. And we want to begin by also presenting a question from the Lord. This question comes from Luke chapter 18. Jesus is in his public ministry. He's passing Jericho. There's a blind man who hears all this noise, this shuffling, and, and so on. He asks what, what's happening, and, and he's told Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so this blind man, and, and obviously no one really cares to help him get to Jesus. They're worried to themselves encounter him. So the blind man begins to cry out. He begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And he's crying, and, and the Lord hears him. And he turns and he says to this man, he says, you know, bring him to me. He comes and he says to the man, what do you want me to do for you? Well, obviously the man says, Lord, I'd like to see. So Jesus cures him, but then says, your faith has healed you. The man begins to rejoice and the whole group begins to rejoice at this miracle. And we want to take that question, Luke chapter 18, Jesus to the blind man, Jesus to each of us, what do you want me to do for you? And that's going to be our question for this third part of our course. Three lectures, the life of prayer. In order to dive even more, I want us now to go to our first lesson on part three. And I want to take us to a very intense moment in the life of Jesus Christ. I want to take us to John chapter 17, a part of what has been called Jesus' high priestly prayer. We know that regularly Jesus would go into solitude in order to pray to the Father. We have very little accounts of what he spoke to the Father about. But we have a glimpse in this high priestly prayer of which John 17 is a part of. And in the midst of this prayer between Christ and the Father, Jesus prays for us. And he prays to the Father, Lord, sanctify them in truth. Now that is a powerful reality when we think about it. That Jesus Christ, as he's praying his high priestly, priestly prayer, right after the occasion of the Last Supper, as he is in the beginning of his passion, he is beginning himself now to feel his human nature, to feel the anxiety, the distress, the fear of the coming passion, he nevertheless, in the midst of his passion, turns to pray for us. And he asks the Father, sanctify them in truth. So once again, we see, as we have repeated in this course, that we so oftentimes think that we're the ones who are seeking after God. We're the ones who are searching for God. And we are so humble to realize that at the end, it's not we who are pursuing him or searching for him or seeking him out. But God is constantly humbling himself in order to seek us out. And here God the Son, at the beginning of his passion, asks God the Father for each of us, sanctify them in truth. Father, make them holy. Father, make them like us. Father, let them share the communion we have. Powerful, powerful prayers. This prayer of the Lord should inspire us in our response to the spiritual life. So oftentimes, we can get so busy. We can have so much hustle and bustle going on in our lives that we just forget to pray or we're too tired to pray or things are just happening all around us. And we just compromise, cut corners. We let the first casualty of our overly busy life become our life of prayer. We just let it go. Once we begin to realize if ever there was a busy moment, an intense moment in the Lord's life, it was at this moment of John 7, 17, 
and he turns to pray and to pray for us. That again should inspire us as we want to develop a life of prayer, as we want to be people of prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. I want to know how to pray. I want to know how to talk to you. I want to know how to understand you. These are sincere petitions of our hearts, and we have to act on them. We have to let ourselves be inspired by the prayer of the Lord, by his example, by the teachings that he has given to us. So we have to now say, how do we develop a life of prayer? How can I respond to so great an example and to so deep a petition for me to be sanctified in truth? We have to develop a habit of prayer. And it is a habit. A life of prayer is not easy. Anyone who thinks, well, I desire to pray, and I know it's something that's good, and I should be doing it, so okay, it's just going to happen. <laughs> that's like saying I like baseball, and I'm going to walk out and become a great baseball player. Not going to happen. Or I really like listening to the piano, I'm going to go and I'm just going to become a great piano player. Not going to happen. If I want to be good in baseball or any sport, if I want to be good in the piano or any instrument, I have to allow myself to be trained, disciplined, develop, principally a habit. So we have to develop a habit of prayer. How do we do that? Well, first, let's look at the things in our lives that are already habits. What are things that we do every day? Some things I'm sure we all share. We take a shower. We brush our teeth. Maybe most of us drive to work. Perhaps many of us stop at a certain coffee bar or stop at a certain location, pick up groceries on the way home, or whatever it might be. What are the habits that already exist in your life? To the point where if a day were to go by that you didn't do it, it'd be weird. That's what we need to identify. Because as we try to develop a life of prayer, the first practical step is to place our prayer in already existing habits. So for example, I know in the morning I'm going to brush my teeth. I am going to pray for five minutes before I brush my teeth. That's it. Every day I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to try to pray before I brush my teeth. Now, I introduced this to some college students and they're like, yes, all right, Father, yes, you know. And one was like, oh, Father, that's only five minutes. Like, what is that? I'm like, yeah, you're right, it's only five minutes. So do it, okay? Well, needless to say, the following month, that was the one who struggled the most. Sometimes it seems so easy. But when we're developing a habit of prayer, even five minutes can be difficult. Because we're not just doing it once or twice or every Tuesday or Thursday. This is something we're trying to do every day. But we have to turn up the heat a little bit. Remember I talked about self-penance. If we want to pray, we're going to have to discipline our fallen nature. If we're going to have to pray, we're going to have to be inspired. It means we're going to have to take this seriously. So I told those college students, and I proposed this as an option. For them, when I said, pray for five minutes and then brush your teeth. So get ready for the morning, take care of everything else you need to do. Pray for five minutes, brush your teeth, and then go about your duties. I told them, if you don't pray, then don't brush your teeth. <laughs> They're all like, Father Kirby, that's gross. I was like, yeah, it is. It's gross to let your soul go without prayer. And if you don't brush your teeth and you feel it in your mouth, then that helps us to understand what our soul feels like if we don't pray. Now, that was for college students. That's pretty strong. But we have to recognize in our life, what self-penances are we going to give ourselves as we try to develop a life of prayer. I'm going to pray for five minutes in the morning. Excellent. It's practical, it's tangible, it's doable. If you don't do it, what's your penance? Most people are like, what are you talking about? Yes, this is serious. What are you going to do if you don't pray? Well, I don't even understand that question. Fair enough. If you don't keep to the resolution of your daily spiritual exercise to pray for five minutes, what do you willingly impose upon yourself? So, for these college students, I told them not to brush their teeth. But maybe for us, it's, well, then I'm not going to have that cup of coffee from my favorite coffee bar. Or I'm not going to 
engage in conversation with friends during lunch. I'll eat outside. Or I'm not going to have a dessert at supper. We have to make self-penances, especially at the beginning. This is very important that we understand this, that if you don't give yourself self-penance, you will not develop at the beginning a habit of prayer. It's very important. So we make this habit of prayer. We connect ourselves, our, our desire for prayer, with existing habits in our life. Identify them and go. I stress again, start small. Remember in the spiritual life, as fast as we pick it up is as fast as we're going to put it down. So start small and just begin to develop. This college student, oh, Father Kirby, five minutes, that's nothing. But it proved to be too much for him. He had to drop to three minutes a day. So be practical with yourself that you know you're going to do, that you can do. And then realize, even in moments where I don't even feel like I'm doing anything, you are doing a huge work by allowing a habit of prayer to be formed in you and in your daily life. If you let yourself do this, eventually you will not be able to imagine a day go by when you have not prayed. It would be as weird as me not taking a shower or not brushing my teeth. It, something's wrong. If we develop a habit of prayer, that's exactly what happens. For to let a whole day go by and I'm not praying, that's just, I don't feel right. Something's, something's essential that, that wasn't done. And then we know that we've developed a habit of prayer. Once things are set, we have this habit, then we can begin to develop and deepen, of course. But again, practical, small, I need a habit. Okay, so with that idea now, We've got this idea of habit and developing a habit of prayer. What are some other things that the church gives us that can help us in our desire to draw close to the Lord, to be people of virtue, uh, to be people of prayer? Well, in our last uh, lecture, we spoke about the particular examine. Now, the particular examine is when we identified a particular defect, a dominant defect that we need an opposing virtue to heal and to conquer. So that's the particular examine. It's particular. It focuses on a certain vice, a certain virtue. Now we speak about a general examine. And what is the general examine? Well, the general examine is the whole day or part of the day. So again, the particular virtue is just this vice and virtue, general examine, the whole day. And the spiritual masters recommend a general examine at lunch or in the evening. Uh, Father Tanqueray says, again, he, he favors both even. But he says, if you have to let the afternoon go, then the evening you should have at least 10 minutes. So that's kind of a longer general examine. What do I mean by a general examine? General examine is a thorough examination of our conscience chronologically. So, for example, if I were to do my general exam at lunch, I would examine from the time I wake up until lunchtime. I go hour by hour. People I've met, things I've said, things I didn't do, I do a general exam. If I do it in the evening, and I did one at lunch, then I just go from lunch to the evening. But if I wasn't able to do one at lunch, then I examine the whole day. And how do I do a general exam? What is this thing we're speaking of? First of all, the word examine comes from Old Spanish, it just means examination. And many of us are familiar with examinations of conscience. And the particular examine and the general examine are really just versions, versions of the examinations of conscience that many of us might be familiar with. So, general examine has five steps. And traditionally, these five steps would be associated with the five wounds of Jesus. So immediately as we begin our general examine, we know that we are placed under the blood of Jesus Christ. Immediately we know this is an encounter with the God who loves us. And there are five steps to the general exam. It's very simple. The first, we begin our exam. The saints recommend an uh, Our Father. So a certain prayer to just transition. And then our first step is we recall God's presence, that God's with us. The second is we express gratitude. What are some things that we are particularly thankful to God for in that morning or that day or that afternoon. 
After the gratitude, then we examine our conscience. We just look at the day. What have I missed? What did I say or do that was, that was wrong or, or uncharitable? We examine ourselves. The fourth step is we ask for God's mercy. And then the fifth step, we make a resolution. So if a person makes an examine, a general examine at lunch, and they realize, man, I was really unkind to my coworker then they might conclude their examine with, well, this afternoon when I see this person, I will go out of my way to show an act of kindness. So the resolution immediately addresses this act of uncharity. The examine is important, and it can be done so quickly. It can be done in three minutes, five minutes. Again, the spiritual masters say if you skip lunch, that you should do a longer examine in the evening. But one could just as well sit down and say, Lord, I know that you're with me. I ask for your guidance. I know that you are pouring your grace and your kindness upon me. I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for Sally's kind comments when I arrived to work. I thank you for that letter that I received, that email that, that I received. I thank you for that. Father, I was very unkind to that coworker this morning who caught me in the middle of other tasks and I, and I was snapped and I was short. You know, and I, I ask your mercy upon me. And when I see that coworker, I'm going to express an act of, of kindness or, or, or gratitude to that person. You know, that could be your examine. That could be your examine. So I, I stress this because one should not be overwhelmed by a general examine. The idea of the examine is that we let God's presence be a part of our everyday life. We let ourselves discern every day, throughout the day, God's presence, God's will in our lives. So the general examine is a tremendous gift. And we began our lecture with the man, the man at Jericho that he, he cries out uh, to Jesus. Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? That would be our question that covers our, our whole part here. Our particular lecture was started with the prayer of Jesus Christ that God the Father would sanctify us in truth. And I want us to take these thoughts and these ideas and the means for prayer that the church gives us. And I want us to go to Jacob's well in Samaria, which is recounted in John chapter 4. Now, Jesus was rarely in Samaria. Most of his public ministry was actually in Galilee, his home province. But on this particular occasion, Jesus is in Samaria. They've been walking extensively. They get to Jacob's well, and we're told the apostles go in order to retrieve some water and rations from the local city. Jesus by himself. He's resting. And a woman of Samaria approaches him, trying to get water from the well. Already we know we have some problems because women did not draw water in the middle of the day because the sun is blistering. Secondly, women collected water in the morning or the evenings. It was a social thing. So the fact that this woman is collecting water in the middle of the day by herself, we already know that this woman is having problems in this community. She approaches Jesus, and Jesus asks her for something to drink. Of course, she's surprised because, first of all, men didn't address women by themselves in that culture. Secondly, he's Jewish, she's Samaritan, and Jews and Samaritans did not associate with one another. And we know later that in her own life, she's an adulteress. So there's a lot going on, and she's shocked that this rabbi from Galilee is now asking her for water. And so, of course, she responds, well, you don't have a bucket, and the well is deep. And, of course, we can only imagine whether she meant it or not. She wasn't just talking about Jacob's well. She was certainly talking about herself. You don't have a bucket. You can't fix me. This well is deep. You don't even have a bucket. And we know that they began to go back and forth in this long conversation. And she tries gender arguments and cultural arguments and religious arguments. She's trying to keep Jesus away. But Jesus keeps talking to her, keeps talking to her, keeps talking to her. And eventually, we see this tremendous conversion in this woman, so much so that she runs to the local town and says, 
come meet this man who told me everything I ever done. <laughs> Amazing. Now that story is powerful in itself. But the Catechism of the Catholic Church takes that story and places it at the beginning of part four of the Catechism, which is the Church's formal teaching on prayer and the spiritual life. We see at the very beginning of part four, the Church presenting the Samaritan woman and this encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And the Catechism tells us in beautiful language that God humbles himself in order to allow himself to be thirsty in order to encounter the thirst of this Samaritan woman. And it is precisely the meeting of the thirsts of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, which is the beginning of prayer. And that's powerful for us, because these are the images and the realities that we need to remind ourselves of when we speak of prayer. Prayer is not a duty. Prayer is not something we have to do. Prayer is the God who greatly loves us, doesn't have to but tremendously loves us, desires to encounter us in our thirst, whatever they might be in our lives. And he himself will allow a thirst in himself so that the meaning of these two thirsts of God and ourselves can give birth to prayer. It's important for us as we see this Samaritan woman, as we hear about the prayer of Jesus, sanctify them in truth, that we remind ourselves of what is being offered to us as we continue through part three of our course, we're going to talk a little bit more about a theology of prayer and specific methods on how to learn the means given to us by the church on how to learn how to pray and develop a life of prayer. We'll be addressing these and many other things in our future lessons. Thank you.